Thank you, John. Okay, so next one is going to be Abdel Nouralouch, and he's going to talk about interpreting for refugees, realities, and challenges for a community interpreter. Good evening. I know it's very difficult uh, after lunch, but I would like to start by thanking the organizers for this wonderful meeting on an issue which is of paramount importance and quite timely. And I think that even the intense dialogues amongst us indicate the great interest. Thank you very much for this invitation. It's a great honor and joy to be here today to talk about an issue that came to my uh, view for the first time in 2016, uh, community interpreting. I started working as a community interpreter after finishing my PhD in conference interpreting. Now, let's start. by defining crisis according to the United Nations because we are talking about translation and interpreting in crisis setting. A humanitarian crisis is to be conceived as a situation of an unusual and generalized threat for human life, health and living. These crises come up within an existing situation, lack of protection, and there is a series of other factors such as poverty, inequality, lack of access to basic services are exacerbated because of a natural disaster or a war conflict. More or less, this is the description of the situation of 2011-2012 in Greece after the civil war in Syria. some important figures that indicate how critical the situation is. And this is inextricably linked with the need to provide interpreting services. 62,600 refugees and to Greece and immigrants. So after 2015, the Mediterranean was crossed by about 1 million people which is uh, the hugest number after the Second World War. We have all these figures that indicate how important it is for these people to have access to interpreting services, to communication, which is an inalienable right. And the NGOs have to be in uh, place uh, they have to be able to talk with these people and solve some issues and cover their needs. This is a report uh, by UNHCR which was published the other day, International Trends. So I took a photo to indicate that right now in Greece we have 173,000 people more or less that need access to interpreting services. They need access to many services in fact, but for them to be able to get to these services they have to communicate and this happens through interpretation. Having said all these, I'm sure we all understand the importance of the situation and how critical the situation is. Those who work in field, but also those that work theoretically in the academia on these issues and try to solve the situation to assist these people to have a future either here or when they move to the country they want. Previously, we had a discussion, a quite intense discussion, I would say, on the terminology used to refer to the people that work in NGOs and humanitarian organizations. 
So I would like to make uh, an introduction on the basis of literature about these terms. We have to be clear on the terms. Here we have a first definition commonly accepted by all uh, translation theorists and it is in uh, the first international uh, conference on interpretation in medical and other services. Community interpreting enables people who are not fluent speakers of the official language of the country they live in to communicate with the providers of public services so as to facilitate full and equal access to legal health, education, government and social services. A second definition, I'm not going to tire you with theories, but I just think that it is very important for us to have some clear terms to use, always on the basis of literature. According to the National Standard Guide for Community Interpreting to interpret the Services of Canada, it is a community interpreting bidirectional taking place during communication of speakers of different languages. The context is the provision of public services such as community services or health services and it is done at government agencies, community centers, legal settings, educational institutions and social services. The term community interpreting is based on community worker and community work which first appeared in English speaking language uh, countries, English speaking countries that had to deal with uh, uh, flows in uh, the states. For example, people coming in from uh, Latin America. So we had uh, the first publications using the specific terms. Community interpreting in Greece, a couple of words about the framework and how it operates today. In Greece, up until the refugee crisis and the huge inflows of 2011-2012, nobody was interested in community interpreting. Some people were involved in some research, but anyway, it was not en vogue the way it is today, if I could use the term. But now we have many people coming in from the Middle East and from Africa, not just Morocco, where they speak Arabic, but also from Sub-Saharan countries. So we see the need for French and other African dialects, such as Lungala and so on. So. We are still at a very initial stage. We need to take many steps forward. I opt for the term community interpreting because according to the Greek and foreign literatures, despite the fact that it seems to be kind of problematic because community could mean EU, the EU, uh, the European community. But anyway, I think, I think that this is the less problematic term of all. Anyway, the term that has less problems for professional interpreters on the field, and not only. From my uh, work on the field, and having talked with many colleagues, and having read uh, what is there in the literature, there is a huge question about us. What are we, those who work in the various agencies? It is a question about the frame and the operations of these people as interpreters. For example, in literature there are some cases. So there is a, a confusion. People who work as interpreters, as community interpreters, 
do not know what exactly they are, because each agency refers to the specific trade or profession with different terms, mediators, uh, uh, legal facilitators. Uh, and even if you see various calls for work, you see that they use uh, various types of terms. So these people have not uh, gone through formal training and they haven't uh, finished uh, school for uh, interpreting or translation and they don't know exactly what they should be called and each agency depending on the role of the interpreter uh, representing a group doesn't really they don't really know what to do and how to handle a situation this question was raised here today in fact cultural mediators, mediators or uh, community interpreters. The term is used widely recently, but at the same time there is uh, this uh, uh, blurred uh, load on the term. And sometimes interpreters do many other things over and above interpreting. For example, they drive the lorry with uh, the refugees uh, to the hospital. Uh, these persons are used as messengers. They say, go give this document to this refugee because this person has to do this or that. There is no clear-cut role. They don't know what their exact tasks are. The same goes for various other colleagues, uh, and there is confusion. So at some point, uh, we have to agree on what we are. In literature, UNHCR has a manual referring to interpreters, mainly in asylum agencies, and it makes clear that interpreters are mediators themselves, and mediation, intercultural mediation does not mean that the interpreter has to intervene or express personal opinions or criticize what is said during the interview. Community interpreting always aims at and taking into consideration the cultural framework and the working languages. So the objective should be to know the cultural importance, the cultural relevance, socio-historic frame, and the current events. This is common with uh, conference interpreters. It is something uh, we are trained on. For example, we have some working languages and we have to really know the culture, civilization, the history, the background, and the framework of uh, the languages we work with. Now, let's get to the practical stuff. A mapping of uh, the places we work, where do we interpret? We have the reception center, reception identification centers, we have the camps, various uh, accommodation centers for unaccompanied minors, for vulnerable groups, usually hotels. The asylum agency, cases of emergency, for example, evacuation of the whole camp and the type of interpreting we need to communicate with the people that are at risk. We have the so-called emergency calls. They are called by various organizations managing the relocation of the refugees. For example, uh, quite recently a great number of uh, refugees left the islands uh, to the mainland Greece. There was a group of 20 or 30 people that had to manage about 150 persons of different national origin coming from different social groups. They have to find places for them to stay in hotels from one noon to the noon of the next day within 24 hours. A huge challenge and there were great difficulties in this endeavor. However, this is reality. 
it's not just theory, we have practice as well. And this is what happens in practice in community interpreting. So in the places where interpreters work, there are various uh, groups, uh, psychosocial support uh, groups, uh, protection, people who work to facilitate the populations that stay in the camps, legal services, informal types of education. There are some groups promoting women's rights. In all these groups, having an interpreter is a must. And the role of the interpreter is different in each group. Now, here, this is very important. Let's have a look at the profiles of people who work as community interpreters. These people, because they were in need, well, they are just, uh, they just know the language. Uh, it could be Arabic or a dialect or some rare languages. And they speak Greek or English quite well, relatively well. As to training, almost none. Just some occasional training programs by metaphrasis or some um, training days by the organizations themselves. No training on interpreting, I would say. As to their educational level, there are variables there. They could uh, have a university degree, of course, in other specialties. Some of them might have started uh, their studies in their countries, but because of the situation they had to interrupt their studies, we have some financial uh, immigrants. And quite uh, recently, various uh, asylum seekers who work as interpreters. I don't have uh, enough time, and I would uh, just like to mention how important it is to or, or rather, that it's important that we don't have this code of ethics in Greece. In community interpreting, the code of contact um, does not exist. There is no published uh, common code of contact. Here again, you see a photo from the same manual of the United Nations, again about the asylum agency, and there are some uh, internet, uh, there are some codes of contact on the internet in English, because in English speaking countries there is some literature and prior experience in community interpreting. Now, for the future, I think it's very important to have a unified frame for the code of conduct. We have to make clear what we are, those who work on the field. What are we? Of course, undoubtedly, I think we are interpreters. I don't know whether it's community interpreting. Yes, of course, it's community interpreting. This goes without saying. But we all have to understand that uh, there are seminars for various uh, professionals, uh, for example, on notions of uh, some used in psychology for psychologists. Those uh, that teach in interpreting seminars shouldn't be psychologists. There are professional professionals that have worked on this field, and those that uh, work. Uh, in interpretation need to be guided by professionals that know their job very well. They need to feel that there is real support and guidance, to feel that there is a frame for them there. Because now they feel that there is no frame at all. Everything is pending on the air. These are my final words. I have many things to say, of course. I know I don't have enough time, so I have to stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>